Li Lu is one of the world's best known value investors. He escaped China after being actively involved as a student leader in the Tiananmen Square protests in 1989. And after escaping China, he enrolled at Columbia University and Columbia Business School. Initially, he enrolled in the American language program simply just to learn English. And following that, he became one of Columbia's first ever students to complete three degrees simultaneously. Uh, Li Lu got his BA in economics Economics, he did his MBA, and he also did a law degree while studying at Columbia. While studying at Columbia, Li Lu also had very impressive investment results. He actually took his student loan money and almost generated student loan float. Basically, he was being paid uh, money for his student loans before uh, it was you know, due to be paid to Columbia for tuition fees and so on. There was a short period of time where he basically had that cash. A little bit like how Berkshire Hathaway uh, with Warren Buffett generates insurance float, where companies like Geico receive cash from insurance premiums that people pay before they have to actually pay that cash out in insurance claims. Li Lu invested that student loan float and is uh, widely rumored to have graduated with no student loan debt and several hundred thousand dollars to his name. I've even heard uh, a couple of versions of that story where he may have actually been a millionaire by the time he graduated Columbia. Not sure exactly how true that is, but nonetheless, the uh, record during his Columbia years is ridiculously impressive. Li Lu then went on to start his own fund, Himalaya Capital, which from 1998 through to the last update we have in 2017, has compounded investors' capital at 19.4% per year. Uh, that compares to about 6.5% in the S&P 500 over that same period of time. And $10,000 invested with Li Lu would have become about 243000 versus only about 31000 in the S&P 500. Li Lu's Himalaya Capital also notably has Charlie Munger as an investor. Uh, up until 2022, Li Lu was the only investor that Munger had ever put family money with. Uh, earlier this year, we actually had a story that Munger had invested with a guy by the name of Charles Jennings, who is the uh, founder of a business called Stonehouse Corporation in Australia. But for a very long time, Li Lu was kind of the go-to money manager for Charlie Munger. Now this video is actually going to be the first part in a three-part series on some of Li Lu's best ever investments. Um, this is an exercise I've gone through a couple of times on the channel recently uh, with both Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. You guys really seem to enjoy these types of videos. So this is going to be part one of Li Lu's best investments and if you want to see uh, part two and part three as I upload them on the channel, be sure to subscribe. Now in this video I want to talk about Li Lu's investment that he made in the late 90s in a company called Timberland. Uh, some of you may remember Timberland as like the waterproof boots that uh, made a lot of appearances for whatever reason in R&B and rap and hip hop music videos. And uh, Li Lu actually shared his Timberland investment story in a 2006 lecture that he gave for Bruce Greenwald's value investing class uh, back at Columbia. Now Li Lu actually stumbled across this particular company uh, simply through value line he uh, said in that talk that he's interested in all sorts of different businesses so he usually just gets the manuals by that he means like moody's manuals value line basically uh, resources that have you know a one page kind of of information about several different stocks and he'd kind of just flip through page by page he's he says in this talk that he got hooked on value line when he was a student. Uh, he loved to read the whole thing from beginning to end, and it was enormously helpful. Now I'm going to put a, a link to Twitter down in the description below to uh, Luke from Snowball Investing, who actually shared a uh, one pager from value line on Timberland. And I believe this is the one pager that Lee Lu actually handed out to the students on that day. Now, Lee Lu did say in the talk that um, that one pager was a little later than the page he was really looking for to uh, kind of share with the students that he actually found in value line. Uh, that particular page has the share price listed uh, in the $40 range, whereas uh, Li Lu bought it more in like the high 20s to, to $30 a share range a little bit earlier. 
So during that talk, Lilu kind of takes us through what he was really hunting for when he looks at a stock in something like Value Line. Uh, he kind of says, I first look at the valuation. You don't really care where it's traded before. And that's probably uh, typical of most value investors. They're not paying any attention at all to stock charts or anything like that. They're trying to understand the underlying business and the valuation of that business as it stands right now. Lilu's initial kind of five second analysis as he described it uh, is first off just trying to understand the quality of the business. And if you've ever heard someone like Warren Buffett talk about what is a good business, uh, he simply defines it as a business that can earn a high return on capital. And that's basically the analysis that Lilu kind of goes through initially so he saw that Timberland had book value of around $300 million and the market cap of the company at the time was about $300 million also. Now, uh, he really wanted to understand kind of what is in that book value. He talks about this concept of kind of wanting to understand how clean that book value is. Uh, he wants to kind of understand whether uh, if things were to go completely south, uh, whether or not this company that he's bought for one times book value uh, can actually be converted into something that can give him some cash back. So, you know, are the assets of this business made up of tangible things like real estate and cash, or is it a bunch of intangibles and goodwill and so on sitting on the balance sheet? Now, of that book value, uh, Lee Lu could see that about $275 million of that was working capital. And he was also looking at Timberland uh, right at the end of the third quarter and uh, he kind of explains that if you know anything about retail businesses and these are just kind of things that you build up over the years in terms of your knowledge bank uh, you'd know that a lot of these companies tend to build up quite a significant amount of inventory at the end of the third quarter they're obviously going into the holiday season and they expect to be able to convert a lot of that inventory into cash by by selling their products so he said that uh, you'll probably collect about a hundred million dollars in cash uh, at the end of the quarter uh, kind of if you look back at what Timberland had done historically by looking at this page on value line. So by Lee Lu's quick analysis, he concluded that you had about 200 million in liquid assets, about 100 million in fixed assets. And he said that if you did a bit of further digging, you'd actually find that that 100 million is almost uh, entirely real estate. So uh, he says that, you know, we're trading at about one times book. The book value seems pretty clean. And I think the implication here is basically if uh, Timberland were to go south and go into some sort of liquidation process and the earnings and cash flows don't really turn up, you've got that underlying really clean book value as a bit of downside protection in the investment. Now, of course, wanting to understand the return on capital and the business quality, uh, Lee Lu then turns to looking at some of the earnings side of that equation. And he says that what he's really looking for is we want to look at the unleveraged pre-tax earnings of the business and then compare that with the kind of capital employed that he, he sort of just worked through earlier. So he said, we've got roughly $200 million deployed uh, kind of in the business, and it looks like they're producing about $100 million of EBIT. So pre-tax unleveraged earnings in the business. $100 million in EBIT versus $200 million in kind of capital deployed in the business gives us about a 50% uh, return on capital employed, which uh, Li Lu concluded is not a bad business. So what then is the reason why Timberland is trading so cheap? It's trading at about one times book value. And uh, Lee Lu mentioned in the talk a few times that it was trading around five, maybe a little north of five times earnings. And what he'd essentially found is that uh, at the time of looking at this page and value line, it was basically the height of the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. And a lot of shoe companies generally were actually um, having a few issues um, due to that. Uh, uh, he said competitors such as Nike were seeing their businesses in Asia kind of fall apart. And Timberland was actually a company that had zero analysts following it. So as a result, you know, being a shoe company, and that's kind of all people really know about Timberland without doing uh, a bit more digging, it kind of just got thrown into that general basket of uh, beaten up shoe companies like Nike. Lilu said that if you just looked at the data and value line, you'd see that uh, profitability had steadily been growing for Timberland 
land and they hadn't always been super profitable but they had always been profitable and it seemed like the earnings were continuing to truck upwards over time but he did find one initial red flag which is that um, insiders owned about 40% of the company which isn't necessarily a red flag in and of itself uh, it can often be quite a good thing actually but he found that they had 98% or so of the voting rights. So Li Lu then uh, did what he describes as uh, becoming an investigative journalist and uh, doing some more digging into what's going on with some of the qualitative aspects of the company, particularly around management. So he found that you had all this insider ownership, uh, a lot of voting rights for those insiders. And uh, he also found like a pile of shareholder lawsuits against Timberland. And he said, uh, you know, are these guys just milking money from the company? What's, what's going on here? And his advice to the students at Columbia was you download every court document for every case and you read them every single page. Now after going through that exercise Li Lu basically found that all of these lawsuits more or less amounted to the same thing just um, there were multiple filings for the same kind of issue and that was basically that Timberland used to give earnings guidance and uh, several times that actually failed to meet that earnings guidance which uh, really annoyed analysts and uh, insiders basically decided just to stop giving giving guidance because they were getting equally annoyed by the analyst community and uh, that resulted in, in basically several lawsuits. So his conclusion from that first bit of work was okay so they're not crooks but are they decent people and uh, this is where the story gets uh, to me really interesting and uh, he does way more work than I would ever anticipate the average investor doing and that's basically that he really really wanted to get to know the people uh, in this business in Timberland as well as he possibly could. Lilo explains that he actually traveled to uh, the town where this family is based, he uh, went to their church, he met their neighbors, tried to speak to basically everyone that knows him, and he actually found that the son, who I believe was the chief operating officer of Timberland at the time, um, was a business school graduate. The dad, who was running the company at the time, actually turned out to have never graduated from high school, but seemed to be you know, a really decent guy by all accounts. Uh, and Lilo noticed that uh, the son who had graduated from business school was on several boards, uh, one of which was run by a friend of Li Lu. And uh, Li Lu actually kind of uh, asked in a favor and got himself on that board so that he could get to know the son really well. They actually ended up becoming reasonably close friends uh, and his conclusion essentially was that the family turned out to be smart and really high integrity people. So Lilu's conclusion here from an investment perspective was that you had this business that had good downside protection, it was trading at one times book value and the book value was really clean, it was cash, a little bit of inventory and, and real estate uh, and it was trading at five or six times earnings and it was growing and he really liked the people that were running the business. So he essentially made the decision to buy the stock and uh, I'll play the short clip of Li Lu describing exactly how much money he allocated to this position. And you look at how much of their international business, how much is actually in shoes and in Asia, less than 10. What they make out of that less than 10% out of the 10% of the 27%. So you calculate all of that, you say that all of them are gone, you're losing money. So what? It reduced your earnings by less than 5%. So, I put a shitload of them. <laughs> Anybody know what happens afterwards? So what ended up happening next? Now Li Lu explains that the stock ended up going up about seven times in two years, which is an astronomical return, but he also explains that most of that massive return was really driven by earnings growth. He had a business that he bought for about five times earnings, and he said that even though that P ratio did go up, the multiple expanded, um, it never really got north of about 15 times earnings. So this huge, you know, multi-bagger home run return uh, wasn't just, you know, Li Lu riding a bubble or anything like that of some super speculative company with no profits. It was that the uh, earnings multiple had expanded but the underlying earnings of the company were also steadily trucking up at like 30% a year. Li Lu also explained that the son, uh, initially the chief operating officer, actually ended up um, becoming CEO and running the business and he actually started engaging with the analyst community again and 
And uh, in that very first analyst meeting, there were three people that showed up. Uh, one of them was Lee Lu, one of them was the CEO, and then there was one other analyst, and, and that was basically it. But um, over time, those meetings got larger and larger, presumably because the stock was doing really well and the underlying business was doing really well. And um, by the year 2000, uh, Lee Lu says there were about 50 or 60 people at that analyst meeting. So uh, that's kind of that was kind of his cue to sell and, and get out of the investment. Now for me, there are really two main lessons from this investment in Timberland from Lelu, besides the fact that um you know, when you have a combination of great earnings growth and multiple expansion, uh, really good things tend to happen. Uh, that's something I think we probably already knew, but this is a great example of that. The two real lessons here uh, I'm going to give you in the form of Le Lu quotes. Uh, and the first one is, if you're not a good analyst, you will not be a good investor. Now, it's clear to me from watching this talk from Le Lu that, you know, he's able to stare at a page and value line for about three seconds and um, pretty quickly draw a lot of great conclusions around what's happening with that underlying business. He can understand the book value, um, you know, basic price multiples, what's in the book value, what's the return on capital, and draw some pretty good conclusions around what's happening with that stock, not, not just um, from the perspective of it being a piece of paper, but also from the perspective of it being uh, ownership in a real business. And as he continues to truck through many different pages about many different businesses and value line, he also builds up sort of this knowledge hub. You know, he understands that in the third quarter of the year, retail businesses tend to build up lot, lots of inventory going into the into the holiday season. And I'm sure he knows multiple sort of nuanced details about all types of businesses from his from his research over the years. The second thing that really stands out, and again in Lee Lu quote form, uh, I'll give it to you here, he says, opportunities like that don't come very often. So when it comes, you have to seize it, you have to do everything complete, but you have to do it fast. When opportunity comes, you have to jump on it, and it's intensive work for a short period of time. This is probably one of the craziest stories I've heard of an investor going and doing deep uh, qualitative work on the management team of a company you know joining a board that uh, you know the son of the CEO was on is not something that the typical investor can do but uh, it really just shows how much groundwork Lee Lu is putting in here particularly before he swings really large at a company. So that is the story of Lee Lu's investment in Timberland I do hope you enjoyed it uh, if you want to catch part two and part three in this three-part series about some of Lee Lu's best investments be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already but that's from me for this one and I'll see you on the next video. Cheers.